Hi, I'm Teddy Alexandro Evans, and you're watching Out at the Center. On March 20th, Richard Burns, the executive director of the center, received the Community Vision Award from LEGAL, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Law Association of Greater New York. Very happy to be paying tribute to two individuals this evening. Richard Burns of the center. There are very few of us LGBT folks out here who are not in some way affected by Richard's years of courage and his generous gifts of time, energy, and vision. Richard, it is with great pleasure and gratitude that I present you Lee Gal's 2008 Community Vision Award. Thank you. So now the center is celebrating its 25th anniversary, and as Lori said, more than 6,000 people come through its doors each week. And we actually have a strong and long-term partnership with Legal. For many, many years, volunteer lawyers from Legal offer the free LGBT legal clinic on the second floor of the center. And people literally line up outside that room for hours. And it's an invaluable service. And, and it's one that you all should be very, very proud that you offer to our community. Because these are queer people intimidated by the legal system who need this help, and Legal has done it for decades. So we're proud of the work that we do for you. We all have lots more work to do, as, as we know, as Brad just talked about. And I feel very honored to be here, and, and I really appreciate this. So thank you. This show, Out at the Center, is a volunteer-produced effort. Three times a year, teams of new volunteer producers go through a training cycle and learn basic camera and editing skills. Over the course of their training, they produce a five-minute segment for broadcast. The following three segments are the first-time work of new volunteer producers. Congratulations to the new teams. We look forward to seeing more of your work. The current generation of LGBT seniors came of age amidst the profound social changes of the 1950s, 60s and 70s. Their stories reflect queer history from the isolation of the past to the triumphs of the present day. Part one of this two-part series takes a look at what it was like to be gay before the Stonewall Uprising, when lesbians and gays felt enormous pressure to conform. Out at the center sat down to hear the experiences of these individuals who are currently active with SAGE our services and advocacy for GLBT elders. I got married when I was 17 so I can get out of the house. I was married for four years and realized the longer I was married, the more and more I kept falling in love with women. And so uh, I guess my husband picked that up and we separated. I wasn't going to get married. I wasn't interested. I didn't I think I was different. I thought it was all normal and fine to have crushes. The, the idea of marriage didn't uh, um, occur to me because I didn't want to cook and clean for someone and be under someone else's thumb. I was proud to be gay before it was okay to be proud to be gay. When I realized that I was gay, um, I said to myself, well, I have to find out where gay people hang out. At about the age of like 14, I got on the train and said, I'm going to find the gay people. And I remember walking down 8th Street, and I got to the corner of 6th Avenue and, and 8th Street, and I had found Nirvana. I fell in love with this woman that lived around the block, and so I got drunk to tell her that I was in love with her. She was my first. 
and I made love to her at the Hudson Hotel here in Manhattan. When my mother first found out, she made my sister call the cops on me. Back then, you could be arrested if you didn't have three feminine articles on you for impersonation. So I made my friend give me her shoes. I kicked my shoes off and trying to look as feminine as I could, finally the cops came. There was nothing they can do. In those days, in the 50s, uh, there was a rule that we had anyway where the woman I was with said, we have to go out with a guy at least once a week so nobody knows that we're a couple. It was very confusing. I went to the bars. Um, I met people. I was with, with people. I had partners. Um, they were never very long-lasting, and they were painful because I was torn between going with guys and going with women. And um, it was a very dark time. It was a very dark time. Back in the 60s, you couldn't be that open. I was constantly being harassed by the police. I was put against the wall by cops, gun put to my head. If you didn't get beat up by the police, you got beat up by um, uh, homophobic, uh, violent kids that roamed the neighborhood. Um, there was really no break. We had, you know, there was no place. No gay center, that's for sure. I did not like Stonewall. I'm not one of these people that has built Stonewall into some magnificent, uh, wonderful place. It was the usual rotten bar. I was living in this apartment. It was kind of a hippie commune. We were involved in everything, Vietnam demonstrations, all that. And I happened to catch the Stonewall um, uprising on TV. first night of the ride, I will never forget this, when the crowd was going nutty and screeching and screaming, I, I tried to get something going. I started hollering, let's march to City Hall, let's march to City Hall. Of course, no one even heard me. You know, maybe 10 or 15 people around me heard it and they started screaming it, but it was too crazy. It made it more freer for people who were living in the closet to be not so afraid to come out. And so that's what I think Stonewall opened up for us. All these thousands of women, as they came out gradually, one by one by one, uh, gave me permission to join them. And be, you know, I had a whole, whole contingent of women, whereas before I was, I was alone, I was the only one, or me and a, another woman were the only ones. The riots, if it hadn't been followed by a political movement afterwards, would have just been um, a, a little bleep in history. I mean, they were important. I'm not trying to take away their importance. But if it had just been the riots and nothing happened after that, I don't think much would have changed. Homophobia, stigma, and discrimination are still major issues confronting the black gay community. This next segment will look at the history and activities of Gay Men of African Descent, or GMAD, a group that started in 1986 right here at the center. GMAD is now based in Harlem and continues to fight homophobia and provide a supportive community to black gay men in New York City. The blackness. So, I'm a black man. Tell me something I don't know. Black gay men are not considered part of the mainstream. We are part of the mainstream. Homophobia, heterosexism, stigma, um, misinformation around who we are as black gay men. Um, I think those are some of the reasons that GMAT was created and I think those are still some of the challenges that we grapple with 20 years later. That we continue to exist as a community is an amazing testimonial to our resiliency. I moved here to Harlem, I think that really began to undo a lot of misperceptions because there was this belief that as black gay men we had somehow left the black community, that we're now gay, we weren't black anymore. And so the fact that we have a physical presence here in a place that historically has been known for black creativity, for black community, I think is amazing.
PMED is generally considered um, to be the oldest black gay organization in the United States. It was started by uh, a Pentecostal minister uh, who himself was um, black and gay. His name is Charles Angel. Reverend Angel um, felt the need to create a space, a safe space for black gay men in New York City. That's sometimes a challenge for us as black gay men. How do we exist in the company of one another. I think we know how to be sexual with each other, but do we know how to communicate? Do we know how to build community? Do we know how to sustain and support one another? And I think I found that at GMAT. It started off as a place to hang out and it became a membership organization, now a full-fledged um, service organization where we're offering all kinds of services. We have several groups here. We have groups practically every night of the week. We have a mental health component, which is our intensive prevention program. And in that program, we work with people who have been victimized by stigma and discrimination. Um, we have two additional programs. We have one for our seniors. Because one of the things that we realize is that as men age up and they become 50 plus, they have a whole other host of issues that maybe some of the younger men in our community don't have. We also have a young adult program for individuals 24 and under um, to help them deal with coming out issues, um, getting back in school, maintaining um, themselves in school despite the stigma or discrimination that they might find there. Uh, we have support groups for individuals that are HIV positive, both um, adult men as well as our young adults. The truth is you cannot get away from HIV is the one, number one issue facing our community. The health epidemic in our community is driven by other factors. And if we don't deal with those factors, then we're not going to get anywhere. Because what's going to happen ultimately is that the 18-year-old, the 16-year-old that I'm seeing today, if his issues are not addressed, becomes the 50-year-old, you know, the 60-year-old who is still depressed, you know, who, who doesn't feel any self-worth, whose whole self-concept is flawed because the entire world, the community to which he looks to, for support, says he's not worthy. So I think one of the things that we're utilizing the program to do is expand uh, the perception, the images of who we are, not just for ourselves, but for the larger black community, so that they realize that we are not only parts of their community, but valuable resources in that community. It really doesn't take money to save a life. It takes commitment, it takes vision, and then when you add money on top of it, you're able to do it. However, the challenge remains that there hasn't been any dedicated funding to actually do anything um, of any substance. I think it's so important to have spaces in places like GMAT where people come and, and revitalize and rejuvenate and, and, and begin to get that love that they need. Because sometimes you need some other people to love you and help you understand and acknowledge how to love yourself. When you love yourself a different way, you treat yourself a different way. I've been here over 10 years, and I've seen some of our young adults go on to become physicians assistants, college professors, police officers, and so that's amazing. But I think the story that sticks out most for me, there was a young man who relocated here to New York City back in the mid-90s and uh, came to GMAD and had a lot of instability in his life. And I think working through GMAD with individual counseling and some of the groups that we have here, you know, he changed that. He was able to go back to school and get a bachelor's degree. And then he had to relocate because he's actually up at Princeton University getting his master's in divinity. When you hear that, you know, you feel very, very inspired and very, very good that we've actually done something, you know, in spite of all the challenges. I always tell people that even after 20 years, GMAT continues to be one of the best kept secrets um, in our society. And I think that it's time that we change that. Out at the Centre now takes you to the world of sports, where we check in with the Gay Basketball League and the Metropolitan Tennis Group. Both gay sports leagues are thriving and their members are having fun, staying fit and changing perceptions about gay stereotypes. I wanted to bring in a, a group of guys that were similar in nature and, and what we do and um, I wanted them to bring basketball in conjunction with being gay and banishing stereotypes with athletics. It is valuable in the community in the aspect that we do want to get the younger generation involved. It gives them an outlet, like I, I, I keep saying, as far as different things to do besides the party life and pump that beat. Um, it gives them a chance to <laughs> it gives them a chance to pump it in another way, to pump it with basketballs. So I think it's very important to put the word out there, especially for the younger kids, the younger generations, that there is other outlets besides, as I stated earlier, the bars, which are not bad, but it's a different outlet for the sports. So as far as that is concerned. I wanted to join this league more so for the community, um, feeling more comfortable, 
playing with other gay men. It was good to find a community that go, wants to watch basketball games, watch other sports, has interest in it. Um, and I think that was, for me, my involvement to meet these guys to do it. And the best thing about it, too, is, you know, if I, when I was growing up watching sports, I couldn't say, oh, that guy's hot. This has given me the opportunity to say that guy's hot or that I love that team because this guy's on it and stuff like that. That's what this network has definitely given me. I've told people that I was playing in a gay basketball league and some of them were like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm sore from the game. And some straight people were like, well, how difficult can that be? It's a bunch of gay men. So there's the stereotype right there. And if they came to one of these games and I'm trying to get them to these games, they would see how tough it really is. I think it's great that it gives people an outlet to play basketball uh, and not have to worry about their sexual orientation, as a lot of people still do, unfortunately. And uh, they can come here once a week and meet new people and get good exercise and uh, afterwards go out and have fun. Uh, and I should point out that some of the players are straight, so this is not a gay members only league. It, it's, it's open to the public to gay and straight people. And uh, we encourage straight players to play, just like with the hockey league that I run. We want to make sure that straight players feel comfortable as well. And it, it's, it's good because they act as ambassadors to their straight community by saying I play with gay, you know, gay hockey players all the time and they're the same as us so you know, there's no difference so it's a good thing. We're just very excited to have our third season start next week and uh, you can see more about us on our website which is nycgaybasketball.org. Yes we are you know we do service the GLBT community primarily and, but it's great to be able to walk onto the court and not worry that you know anything is going to happen to you, that it's a totally safe space. Um, it's a great way to meet people and network with our, within our community. And you know it's just it's a really nice opportunity to, to play a sport. People at any level can be competitive because we structure all of the, the events where we um, put people at similar skill levels into the same division. So whether it's a tournament or even an event like tonight, you're, you're not going to have a very advanced player competing against a person who's just a beginner. Coming to New York, um, the first year I was here, it was difficult to meet people because I don't really go out to the bars. But um, when I joined MTG, the guys have been very friendly, very open, very uh, welcoming. And um, it's been, yeah, good for my self-esteem in that regard. In addition to just, um, you know, being able to call up someone and you know, ask to go out, ask them to go out for a drink, and not really feel that it's a date per se, even though by by definition it is. I actually was talking to one guy who um, who played tennis in school, and he had the th same thought that I did, thinking, oh, gay men playing tennis, how hard can they hit the ball? Some of them can hit the ball pretty hard. Because tennis really in the city is such a rare commodity, the courts, it's hard to get to. You really have to want to play. It's a little more expensive than the other leagues. People who come to play really want to play. The best thing about playing in, in, M, in MTG is, is that I get to play men who are better than myself and I get to improve. Yeah, I guess the main thing is I was, I was petrified to join. And, and four years ago, I wanted to join. And I encourage everyone, don't be afraid. There's no judge. It's not. It's a non-judgmental atmosphere. So even if you're really bad, like I was when I started, people are very encouraging and open, and they just want to have fun. And and they, uh, the league puts you with people in your own category. So it's a safe place to learn and, and improve your game, and it's it's so much fun. And I recommend. Don't be afraid. Uh, to people who want to try it, just, just do it. Cynthia Wade, producer and director of Free Held, stopped by the center to talk about her documentary, Winning an Oscar, and the social politics of her film that depicts both a human rights struggle and a love story. How is it that you came to find the couple and find love? You know, I wasn't expecting even to make this film at all. I was definitely looking around for my next film, but I read an article in a paper that said that this police officer, really fairly close to where we live in New York, was being denied the right to leave her pension to Stacy, her partner. And I decided to go down to a community meeting where many of the townspeople were protesting the elected official's decision. Went down there, the room was packed, was filled with signs, angry people. People began to petition, plead with the, with the freeholders. Th those are the elected officials in New Jersey. And within about five or 10 minutes, I realized 
this is my next film. For as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to be a police officer. That's who I was going to be. Approximately one year ago, a little longer, I was diagnosed with cancer. It was scary. I figured, ah, we could beat it. I'm 49 years old. My prognosis is such that I have probably less than a year left. The whole the community effort spoke to you. Was the first impression before you even met your, this, your yeah. subject? I mean, I think the fact that an entire community, gay and straight, were behind Laurel and her partner saying, this is wrong, this is an equality issue, this is a civil rights issue, I think that that struck me, particularly because there were a lot of these kind of heterosexual male cops that normally would not have been considered gay allies. But they saw one of their favorite police partners facing this discrimination that they didn't face. They could leave their pension to their wives. So it became very personal for them. And they stood with her as she fought this battle. I am her wife. I am her caretaker. She is everything to me. There is no doubt in my mind that Stacy deserves my pension. Were it not for the fact that we're not a heterosexual couple, she would receive it. I mean, just watching the trailer, it's a very wrenching story. And I think, did it take, is it kind of a psychic toll as far as trying to cover this and ma in the making of this? I think this film had um, particular challenges for me because she was dying, and she was dying rapidly. And so it raised all kinds of ethical issues in terms of what do I shoot and what do I not shoot? Do I shoot her when she's getting her medicine? Even though she said I could, does that mean I should? Do I shoot her at her most vulnerable state when she's sleeping? Um, I wanted to be able to show the amazing caretaker that Stacy was, because Stacy was the most amazing caretaker I'd ever witnessed in my life. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, if my husband can take half as good care of me at the end of my life as Stacy did Laurel, I would be a lucky woman. Stacy was amazing. And I wanted to be able to show that, but you don't want to cross the line and exploit somebody in these incredibly wrenching, dramatic, emotional moments when they really they need privacy. So that, walking that line, I think ethically, was really challenging. At the Academy Awards, when you accepted the award, you did speak, uh, it was very well worded in how you mentioned that. It's interesting, a couple of um, major gay and lesbian leaders came to me and they said, if you have the opportunity to have 20 seconds on a stage in front of 35 million people, do not waste it doing a whole line of thank yous to people that will be sort of forgettable. Don't waste it. If you have 20 seconds, you need to speak to the fact that you are married and you have rights that other couples don't have. And so I took that very seriously. They said, you really need to speak to straight America. Thank you. It was Lieutenant Laurel Hester's dying wish that her fight for, against discrimination would make a difference for all the same-sex couples across the country that face discrimination every day. Discrimination that I don't face as a married woman. I was really speaking to straight America, you know, the person in the armchair that isn't normally thinking about LGBT rights but should. Um, and I think that has made a difference just in terms of the emails that we've gotten, completely unsolicited emails from people in the middle of the country who saw it or have read about it, and that's a good thing. Actually, on Oscar night, free held was the number one Googled term on the planet. So that's outreach right there, to be, able to be able to say that and to have that kind of impact. And to all our supporters and our families who believed that a 38, even a 38-minute movie could change minds and lives, and our children who remind us about what's really important, and to Stacy, who's here tonight, who's really auto mechanic by day, but hero in life, who always did what was right, and she's here tonight. So thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all for this edition of Out at the Center. As the credits roll, we will speak with Kate Clinton, who is at the center along with director Andrea Myerson for the DVD release of their latest film covering Kate's 25th anniversary tour. What a coincidence, it's the center's 25th anniversary as well. 
I'm Teddy Alexandro Evans. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. with Kate Clinton and Andrea Meyerson here to celebrate her 25th anniversary as a stand-up comedian. Oh, and how does that feel? I am with Andrea Meyerson who oh, okay. filmed my 25th anniversary show. Lucky and, me. Yeah. Lucky me that I got to film her 25th anniversary tour. We had a contest so that people could name the tour. And there were some suggestions uh, that didn't make it. Um, <laughs> Antiques Roadshow. I love it. I love it. She's just the best. And she's gotten better over the years, and I love her politics. She's right on target. She's great with the politics. What do you think? I think she's one of the smartest people I know. I think she should be in politics, but then she couldn't comment on them so well. And George uh, from Georgeville, Population George. Oh, my God. <laughs> He's out there explaining it away. He was out there all week explaining it away, going, well, you know, if, if, if Al-Qaeda calls, <laughs> we want to know who they're talking to. I'm like, honey, uh, Al-Qaeda's on the phone. So we're here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the center as well. It's right. the clash of the anniversaries. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled that Andrea came all the way from California. I did. I did for Kate, because I love her. And I do. I was at the center many years ago with Laughing Matters, wow, my first right. film. So I'm happy to be back. I'm, yeah. I'm, great turnout. I more than admire you, Kate. I love you. But I've never been able to tell you because it's unprofessional. Us being queer, lesbian, comic pioneers and all. But I love you in a broke back mountain sort of way. And if loving you is wrong, correct me if I'm right. Hey, Kate Clinton. Happy 25th anniversary. You've been doing this for 25 years. You've been making us laugh. You've been making us think. And I, for one, am very grateful for that. But I don't have kids, uh, so that, yeah, well, that I know of. Um, there, there was that softball summer. <laughs> Ooh, uh, 